if anyone else pops on, then that will be good. Let me just get my notes here. So good morning, everyone. We are into the month of November for our Bricks and Balloons. Bricks and Balloons is an opportunity to network with other member businesses the first Thursday of the month, just for the half an hour, a deep dive into business related conversation of what holds you back and supports you getting ahead. We learn and grow from others' experiences while identifying new connections in Lennox and Addington, and each month will be a specific topic. So this month we are going to be discussing competitors, both direct and indirect competitors. I have a series of questions and most of the time we, I, I time it of two minutes each, but uh, happy to extend that today. So let's start with direct competitors. Maybe just think of the sector that you're in. So we have Jack with real estate and, and Charlie with the bank. Um, my first question to you is, why is it good to understand and acknowledge your competitors? You want to go first there, Jack, or you want me to jump in? In, in real estate, it's a very competitive uh, market, very competitive world. And uh, there's a couple of things that are important, I think, with understanding your competitors. But it's that um, it's finding a niche, finding a spot where, in, in my business anyway, Charlie, it's, it's finding a, a niche where you provide value added in addition to competitors. Uh, but again, there's so many competitors that it's hard to differentiate from absolutely every one of them. So partly what, what we find is uh, is visibility, visibility, visibility is important. Uh, so, uh, and then the other part that we find is uh, that, that we have to, for us, it's building the relationships that competitors can't, can't get a toehold into so that they can they can take them so if we un we understand a few of our competitors and we we know some of the ones especially working in our area uh, and we know where we have advanta advantages over over them and uh so it's just it's, it's but it so it's basically a, a constant awareness of your competitors a constant awareness of, of what they're doing and who they are and who brings something to the table who who brings pizzazz uh, sizzle but no steak to the table and there's a lot of those around so it's just uh it's a it's it's a constant challenge anyways do you think jack a part of that is also longevity and experience in real estate i don't i don't know as much to be honest with you megan um the fact that i have longevity and experience i'd like to say that those are key factors but i, I really don't know if they really are I think what's happening is there's been an evolution starting to happen where it's kind of a traditional and, uh, and social media uh, group separation. And what's happening is the, it's a lot of the millennials that are, that are full, full to the nines on understanding social media and have, have grown up with it. Uh, for, for those of us that have that experience and, and have been, have a little longevity, it's just, uh, it's like going back and learning Word all over again. Uh, it's just, it, it's, it's hard to get through that barrier to, to be producing as much and the, the stuff that they do. So it creates a challenge for us that we end up having to figure out ways around it, recognizing that that's an issue. And then, uh, and then, and then having to sell some of the stuff that we bring to the table that's not luckily for us, us most of our clients, uh, the millennials are getting mostly the millennial clients, uh, but with some others, what we get almost exclusively, we get people that are uh, in their uh, mid forties to uh, mid sixties that are are comfortable with the style and the stuff that we bring to the table. So it's not saying we're, we're anti-diluvian, that we're dinosaurs, um, but at the same time, we just don't have that same uh, uh, piss and vinegar that the uh, the millennials have as far as the, uh, the social media. Yeah, good answer. Charlie, what about you? What why is it good to understand it and acknowledge your competitors? Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Hey, Rick. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting um, 
for me, you know, um, I work strictly with investments and um, I'm fortunate that, that RBC is the largest mutual fund provider in Canada and our products themselves have always outperformed. They're, they're head and shoulders above, you know, what the, the big five can do in terms of the comparables. And yet we still, that's not enough of a talking point to earn the business by itself, um, which I, you know, I thought it would be a little bit easier coming into this, to be quite frank, because if, if I, you know, say, you know, we're doing 7% consistently and, and you're getting 5%, anybody with money in the bank, you'd think would be rushing over to get that extra 2%, but there is a lot more to it than that. There is a lot of, um, relationship management, of course, which is not my personal function, but it's obviously a big, uh, big deal in terms of banking and, and having that relationship. Um, and there's a lot of loyalty. So you, you, you know, it's not just about the, the product itself, of course, it has to be, um, you know, how you're engaging with your clients, how you're treating your clients. And, uh, and then, you know, using that to, to gain some visibility as Jack put and have some, some uh, word of mouth, uh, you know, good, good feedback within your community, because that is going to drive more of your business than strictly saying, Hey, we've got the best product um, for the best price. You know, that's not enough. And so, you know, um, we, we need to look beyond, you know, what our competitors are doing in terms of their solutions and really look at how they're, how they're benefiting their clients in other ways. Very good. Thank you. Rick, um, good morning. We're talking competitors today, starting with direct competitors. The question is, why is it good to understand and acknowledge your competitors? D did you want to answer that or I'm happy to move on to the next question? Uh, just very quickly, um, I always check that. Um, so you're talking my competitors' social media? Uh, competitors in, in the same products and services that you yep. your, your business serves. Um, definitely, we check out our competitors. Um, if they're not active in social media, um, to me, that's not entirely uh, professional. Uh, I don't know if the company is active. Uh, I check their LinkedIn, LinkedIn page. Uh, if it's not done upright, uh, I'm wondering, uh, uh, are they trunk tippers? Uh, that's a term we use for... Uh, somebody without um, uh, feet on the ground <laughs> drives around their truck. Uh, but but mostly I'm talking about uh, the IT industry, uh, which I am in. So that I, I presume that term only applies to the IT industry. Um, but, but definitely, um, uh, I look at the competitors to see what they're doing right. And I can always learn and what they're doing wrong. And... Uh, I'm glad I'm not there doing the wrong stuff. <laughs> well, that's a good segue into the next question. How do you find out who your direct competitors are? Is it just something that comes with the industry that you're in? Is it is it noticeable right away? So how, how do you find out who your direct competitors are? Um, mostly uh, just the internet. Uh, if they're active on the internet, then I consider them strong competitors. Uh, if they're hard to find, I consider them not strong competitors. Rick, what'd you do before the internet? Come on, you gotta tell me. How did you, uh, how did you know who your competitors were? Before the internet? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, that would be- That's when you had that job at the escort service, didn't you, Rick? <laughs> That, that would be word of mouth. Um, uh, just talking to people and uh, mostly you hear bad stuff. You know, not everybody talks about the good stuff, but everybody talks about the bad stuff. So that's sure. a really good way of uh, uh, being aware of your competitors um, uh, just by talking to people. And you hear the good stuff and you hear the bad stuff. Right. What about, what about Charlie or Jack? How do you find out who your direct competitors are? Well, ours is real easy for me <laughs> we're working on our area so sorry sorry charlie go ahead yeah no i was just gonna say i mean for me um 
you know, my industry is dominated by, by major players. Um, so, you know, working, working with the banks, you can walk down the street and know who your competitors are. There's also some smaller players there that you kind of, you hear about through just word of mouth, you know, your clients um, will tell you that, you know, they have, they have certain assets in certain places and you, you kind of just pick up, you know, uh, that way, you know, who, who's, more dominant who's who's making a, a bigger capture of the marketplace that way so i'd say mostly from your clients yeah next question what is the benefit of a direct competitor what do you think the benefit is or is there one well one one um one thing i can think of is if they're overpriced um, it's usually noticeable, but sometimes clients haven't done their research and they don't really know. Uh, and, uh, now, now it, it's not only that they charge too much. I think it's more important if they charge too little, because then, you know, <clears throat> you're going to get stung later on. Yeah. So it goes both ways. That's, that's interesting insight. I do, I do like that. It, and, and it is inter it's a mindset, right? Sometimes people almost are attracted to higher prices, thinking they'll get more value because of the higher price. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I know we sort of talked about any, anyone else in terms of what is the benefit of a direct competitor? Uh, yeah, one of the benefits is if, if you know who your, your main direct competitors are, you can you can look at what they're offering, look at what they're doing and and see if you can differentiate. The other thing is having direct competitors. Oh, where'd you go, Jack? This and uh, how people oh, connect with somebody. Can you hear me? Yeah, you, you cut out a little. Do you wanna just finish the end, end of that? Yeah, my internet connection is unstable. It's one of the things I'm trying to take find time to look at today. Uh, so I, I, I keep drifting in and out. Uh, basically, by having people who are direct competitors, uh, some of the clients are a better fit for some people than others. And, and we fully understand that. So we'll have neighbors and stuff that will choose another agent and we don't get offended by it whatsoever because a lot of it is uh, personal recommendations a lot of them is past history a lot of that kind of thing uh, but knowing who your competitors are so when you go in and you talk to a client we'll for example we'll position if we're, we're trying to get a listing uh, or even a buyer relationship going we'll talk to the client we know who the competitors are at the table um, it's easy for us without slamming the competitor of course is to talk about our advantage in certain areas that we know they're not as strong. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, BS uh, agents out there as well that basically look at their website and, and God, it sounds like they walk on water. They're high ethical, high this, high that. They practice everywhere in, in Eastern Ontario. They, uh, they promise the sun, moon and stars and, and a lot of them just don't have the skills to be able to do it. So it's, it's, it's good to be able to, when you you know that if you're going in to get a listing and you've got a couple of different people that you can accentuate your strengths vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the hype, the bullshit that, that comes out of uh, a, a lot of people. Because uh, a lot of people, it's all sizzling, no steak. So it's a matter of, uh, of trying to position that without dissing, dissing the, other, the other competitors. So. And I think com competition is a is a healthy thing. It, it pushes you to grow and, and be challenged. Mm. Have any of your competitors ever sent clients to you? So, you know, for example, they are they don't have enough staff and, and they know how good you are in business. And they've they've you know, even though they're competitors, they've actually sent you clients. Has that ever happened to any of you? Yes. And how did it make you feel? Uh, it, it makes, uh, personally, it makes me feel that all the many years we put into our reputation uh, kind of has come to fruition. Um, you know, you, your, your name's out there, your reputation's out there. Uh, and um, uh, these other uh, businesses 
uh, definitely are not going to send any client to us unless they're sure that they, we are going to service the client uh, to their expectations. And, and uh, you know, so. Uh, We've had the same too. Um, I remember when I used to have my previous business, which was uh, consulting for uh, call center environments, uh, we had, I, I would go to trade shows back when they used to do trade shows in those days. And uh, I, I would spend, I'd leave my staff in the booth to talk to clients. I'd walk around and talk to my competitors um, just so I could understand what they were doing, maintain a positive relationship with them. And because of services that we provided in some of the areas of the, our expertise in that sector that were not necessarily the expertise of our, our competitor, uh, we did get referrals uh, back in those days just because people, again, like, like with you, Rick, people trusted us and knew that we were, we were good at what we did. But we also get it in, uh, we also get it in real estate as well. I've had uh, competitors who have referred to me stuff that uh, they've got a commercial client, that they're an ongoing client for residential, but now they have a commercial thing. It's not their expertise and they want to do the right thing by the client. So they'll talk, talk to us because I've done a lot of commercial in the past. Uh, we've had other ones who maybe specialize in, in Kingston market. We know much more about the market up in our area, up in uh, uh, Stone Mills. And so we've had people refer and now refer in those situations works well because they get a, they get a 25 to 30% uh, uh, split with us on a commission if they refer to us. So it's an encouragement for them to say, yeah, I'm not an expert in that area. So let me get somebody who is more of an expert there. And by maintaining good rapport and maintaining a good image of, of uh, what you provide, what you bring to the table and, and how you deal with your clients and other agents, all that stuff, uh, people are more inclined to, uh, to refer to us. I've also done the same with other agents, by the way. Uh, condos in Kingston, for example. I, I've got a special, I do a specialist there. So there's a variety of things. And, and just from these conversations and the remarks that both Rick and Jack just gave, that's not fair. competitors necessarily aren't, or the word competitor isn't necessarily a negative one because you can use it as, as a healthy, healthy competition where you each help each other. We're yep. going to, we're going to move on to indirect competitors. I was, I was really intrigued with this uh, portion and, and really it's products or services that are close substitutes that would satisfy the same need for your consumer. Um, for example, if you were to go traveling, say to Toronto, you have multiple options. Are you gonna choose a car? Are you gonna choose a bus? Are you gonna choose the train? So that's what we're looking at when we talk about indirect competitors. My first question is, are you aware of who your indirect competitors are? Yeah, we are. Uh, it's, it's, as you, if you follow the real estate business at all, uh, there's a lot of companies that are coming out and uh, basically trying to take the place of a real estate agent by providing a lot of good on-site information, uh, maybe giving them a cheap rate just to get the property listed and then the owner takes care of it themselves, um, that kind of stuff. So we, we do keep an eye on those so that we know what's happening with them. We know what kind of service they're providing. And we also need to know because we need to know where the slippages are and the kind of service they're providing. Uh, there was just a big CBC, for example, thing that came out talking about agents were steering people away from this home that was uh, for sale by owner. Yeah. Well, but when the analysis was done, what ended up happening is the number that was on the listing was not the right number to get in contact. The, uh, the price that it was listed at was 14 million instead of 1.4 million. Uh, there were a lot of gaps in, in the property. There was not enough information. So it basically meant that People were not wanting to go there. The agent that said, I can't, I can't get in touch with them was right on. He couldn't get in touch with them. Um, so it just, it meant that that service wasn't providing what it was trying to do. But again, there's a lot of pressure right now. Uh, these real estate people make way too much damn money. So uh, we should be able to sell this property ourselves. And unfortunately, it's, uh, it, 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 we make it look a lot easier than it is so that sometimes people can be deluded into thinking, well, hell, I'll just sell it myself. Um, so it makes it easier for those companies to come in, especially with some of the advertising they do, um, that 
kind of puts us in a, in a bad stead when and, and puts them in a good stead when that's not justified. How about you, Charlie or Rick? How, are you aware of who your indirect competitors are? I mean, um, for financial services, there's there's definitely been a, a shift in the mentality, uh, particularly in the advisor relationship. Um, I don't know if uh, if you've seen like the, those Quest Trade commercials, for instance, where they basically, you know, uh, almost like slander the what the advisor brings to the table. Um, so similar to what Jack was saying, where um, whereby they're saying, you know, why would you why would you pay more um, for an advisor when they don't they don't really help you in any way, and uh, and you know you can just do it all yourself through our website, uh, which is very actually misleading, especially the statistics that they use. Um, that's specific to Quest Trade. There's obviously other disruptors in there as well, um, but the simple fact of the matter is, you know, uh, there there is. Um, there is a, a more of a shift now because uh, not just the pandemic and people aren't going into financial institutions as much, but just the younger population, they want to have a more hands-on approach and they want to do it more themselves and, and save on that cost structure. And, you know, ultimately they could be putting themselves in a worse position because, um, you know, they're not, they're not dealing with accredited planners. They're not getting the best solutions. Um, and, and so the overall, the offering just quite, isn't quite there despite how it's presented to them. So, um, you know, that, that's a, a situation where, you know, we, somebody in my function, we, we are, are very much against the message that they're putting out, even if, you know, they do have a solution that, you know, it, it might be adequate and maybe there is some benefit because it does get more people interested in starting a savings plan for their future. But, you know, the way that they're going about it is, is underhanded to the point that they are doing the clients a disservice as well. Um, so, so it's kind of a, a, a dichotomy there. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think that, um, you know, the indirect competition, it's, it, it's about proving, you know, your competitive advantage as well as, as the personal touch that you put on it overall. Exactly. Thank you for that. I, I think we've kind of touched on this, but is there anything additional to how do you market yourself differently from an indirect competitor? I know we talked relationship building. Is there any other way that you market yourself different from an indirect competitor? It sounds like Charlie and I have the same, the same type of challenge with uh, indirect competitors. Um, people offering the uh, doesn't cost you very much and uh, you can do it yourself when everybody's not sophisticated enough to do it themselves. Very few people are. Um, and so th the plus that we do with our marketing is we really try and present a personal issue, a personal image so that people can see that we are good people to deal with, that we're, we're there to help them. We talk about our expertise in, uh, in our local area in the area that we do most of our stuff in and, uh, and try and differentiate yourself from those areas in that regard. And again, sometimes you can put a, a subtle message into your, uh, into your presentation when you're doing a listing presentation that, that describes uh, some of the, some of the, we've seen a few people who have, have sold privately and, or have mostly bought privately. It's even worse for people who buy privately. And what happens is they end up, the seller doesn't have to tell them about all these inadequacies of the property or all of these challenges, or even direct them to stuff, stuff that can be an issue for them. So we've seen a lot of people end up with major problems afterwards. And they, they've said to us, well, we'll never, we'll never do that again, especially as a buyer, you don't have to pay it. So, um, so, so for, for us, it's basically helping people to realize that, yeah, th those, there's, those services are there. We're, we're not averse to them but recognize whether that's right for you and recognize whether that's going to give you the best, best bang for your buck kind of thing. Great. Thank you. Does anybody have any examples of indirect competitors in your industry? We have the IT industry here with Rick and, and real estate with Jack banking with Charlie. What are some examples of indirect competitors in your industry? There's a lot of them in my industry. Um, uh, so 
Zillow, uh, there's a whole, whole bunch of them that, that uh, and, and they advertise very strongly as well, that uh, basically they, they can provide you, there's one of them that lists, they'll, they'll list your place for an MLS for $200, and then you take over everything from there. Uh, there's other places that, uh, that was the one I was telling you about earlier, there's other places that will provide a, a really uh, cut rate service. And, and again, some of the stuff they do is, is really, really good. Um, if, if you're computer savvy and if you're just looking at that end of it, but there's a lot more than just finding the right house. There's the negotiating, that knowing the hidden things to look at, all that kind of thing. Um, so basically, I, I think with, with, uh, with, with our competitors, it's just a matter of... Uh, of being aware of them and, and like there are a lot of them now and in fact there's people that are talking in our industry of maybe 10 years from now it's going to be a very different industry who knows really? is would property guys be a uh, an indirect oh, yeah. competitor okay oh yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that's similar yeah. to there's a, few, there's a few property guys type companies out there as well yeah okay and they come and go hey eh, jack <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah so interesting well, I love the dynamics uh, um, here today. I love the different sectors and I appreciate you guys coming. We only have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that you wanted to finish off with a final thought in terms of competitors, um, both indirect or direct or, or any, anything else to do with those topics? Is there any final thoughts? Uh, just one thing, uh, Megan, is uh, I was having a hard time trying to think of an instance where I was concerned about uh, indirect competitors. And, and really, I, I couldn't think, think of, of a time when, when that's happened in uh, any of my industries. And I, I, I'm trying to think why. And I think the reason is uh, skill set. Um, I've never come across uh, an indirect uh, competitor that has um, the, the proper skill set to actually be a competitor. Interesting. And I, and I, I guess my final question is to you all is, is this something that yearly or on your five-year plan or whatever the case may be for your business, is this something that you, you take into consideration and you actually, you actually have some thought into in terms of your competitors? Well, I do that weekly. Nice. So weekly That's for right. you and That's same Jack. No, I, actually, I missed out on the last part of your question. My unstable computer uh, internet connection screwed me around again. I just wanted um, to know how often you think of your competitors. Is it something you think on a yearly basis? For for Rick, it's a oh weekly God, no, basis. No, 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 no. Similar to to Rick, it's it's got to be on a regular basis. Um, and but the thing I I would give as being a, a thought on it is that rather than competing direct and indirect computers as as your uh, competitors as your enemy. Um, I think it's important to not have enemy relationships with them, but to have an understanding so that you know how you can differentiate. And if you're not aware of who your competitor is, then you, you can't do that process of figuring out where their strengths and weaknesses are so that you know how you can differentiate. So I think it's really important to know, to know them and to know that they're not your enemy. They're just other people that are out in that same marketplace trying to make a dollar too. Uh, and it's just a matter of you've got to just know where your strengths are vis-a-vis -vis theirs. Great. Well, we've come to the time of nine o'clock. Um, the next Bricks and Balloons will be Thursday, December 2nd at 8.30. Thank you very much. It was nice to see all of you and have a great weekend. Megan, can, I have, a word with you? can I have a quick word with you, Megan? Have a great